Good, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Nick Worth. I'm the technical director of Worth Research. I've got a colleague, Rob Rouser, who's going to take you through some interesting innovations we've been done doing recently in the world of wind loading uh, using computational fluid dynamics. A little bit about the company. Um, there we go. Buttons right. So, um, a quick overview. We've got a very interesting, diverse company um, working in a number of interesting and different sectors. Uh, basically, we're a motorsport company in, in its heart. I've had a 32-year career in pinnacle motorsport design, starting most of the early years in Formula One and then graduating on to IndyCar design, Luan car design, more recently working in uh, Aussie supercars. Um, but we've uh, diversified uh, in the last 10 years into work in the built environment, um, automotive, mainstream automotive. We're doing some amazing stuff in the world of uh, supermarket refrigeration and the general uh, energy use in supermarkets. Um, we've got some great, doing some great work with Lockheed Martin in innovative UAVs. And uh, also we provide aerodynamic solutions which uh, um, can be bolted on existing commercial vehicles which uh, can um, pay the cost of them, uh, them back in uh, sort of single digit months nowadays. So we're working in a large range of sectors but we're here to talk about uh, architecture. And um, we started off, Rob's going to take you through some of the other services we've been working on in architecture uh, for the last eight years. but. Um, we're here today to talk about the latest um, developments on the very difficult subject of modeling, building, wind loading. So why is it important? Why are aerodynamics important on tall buildings? Well, basically, the amount of wind loading on a tall building has a fundamental effect on construction cost. It can limit the height you can go to uh, with a building. and depending on the other environment, depending on the height, depending on the structural properties of the building, um, the, the aerodynamics of that building may require um, expensive complex mass damping, which has an effect in terms of the usable area at the top of the building, which is prime real estate. It's just generally an undesirable thing to do. So we've got a lot of experience um, in aero development, and as I say, my background is um, Formula One car designer and then on to other things. But Worth Research was started in 2003 and we've had a, a long-standing relationship with one big OEM which is American Honda and our primary task was to um, help them win the Indy 500 in IndyCar development. So in those days uh, we were using subcontract computational fluid dynamic services and to develop the car aerodynamically we were using a combination of scale model and full-scale testing. Um, I call it low-res CFD. Um, it's kind of fairly, it was fairly conventional at the time. It was the best that could be done. It was actually the CFD division of Honda's Formula One team um, back in 2003. But we found the correlation to, between CFD and the wind tunnel was really poor. So it's, uh, it was about a 25% hit rate. So you found, you tried a change in CFD, got all excited about it, oh, it's a big reduction in drag, a big improvement in downforce, which is an important parameters for a race car. We took it to the wind tunnel, and on, it only worked about one time in four, which is not a very good hit rate. And actually, while CFD was interesting for explaining the coupling of phenomena, a flow phenomena at the front of the vehicle and how it flowed to the back of the vehicle, kind of gave us inspiration. That poor hit rate, really wasn't that useful, but we still did it. We then went on, um, when we changed out of IndyCar and, and went into endurance racing with Honda and started going after winning Le Mans for them and the American Le Mans Championship, we took the opportunity to, we'd realized what was going wrong with this external contractor and there was this fundamental moment in time, probably the best decision of my life, where I thought, well, I've, I know what's wrong with their process do I tell them and get them to fix it, or do I say, you know what, let's bring CFD in-house, let's invest? And uh, luckily, I made the latter decision, which involved uh, employing uh, my colleague Rob at the time. So we brought in our own um, CFD technology, and that was the kind of advent of um, high-res CFD. 
Um, at that time, what I can tell you about it is we were starting to do full boundary layer modeling on absolutely all the surfaces, which wasn't done before. Um, we were using a much, much higher grid count and better turbulence modeling, and that's about as much as I want to say. But immediately, when we brought the CFD in-house and using this recipe that we thought that our subcontractors should use, but we didn't want to tell them how to do it, the hit rate of CFD-inspired development just went straight up to 75%. So in other words, three things out of four that you thought were going to be good from CFD, when you took them to the full-scale wind tunnel to validate, they were good. And that had a profound effect on the development speed of our racing vehicles. So when you had the wind tunnel and CFD pretty much in line, the, the rate of development you made, because you weren't taking two steps forward and one step back, you were taking three steps forward with the occasional step back. And then more recently, with using technology which is very similar to what Rob's going to show you that we use in buildings, we are above 95% in terms of hit rate. Actually, honestly, it's above 99%. So 99 th th things out of 100 you would go and test in a full-scale wind tunnel would be correctly predicted by the latest CFD technology. And it's had a profound effect on aero development rate. And the bottom line is, because aerodynamics is so important in race cars, in the same way that aerodynamics is important in tall building design, the more we invested on aerodynamics, the more we won races and championships. And, and I have to apologize, my business has got a very unfair advantage. When you mix someone who's obsessive compulsive like I am in terms of technology and development with a customer like Honda who's obsessive compulsive about winning no matter what, um, and you start getting on a spiral of success. So Honda spent with us, with my business, in the period 2003 to 2017, 75 million US dollars on the subject of computational fluid dynamics development. So not one dollar was spent on buying a wheel nut for one of the Le Mans cars we supplied, a, a wing for an Indy car. 75 million dollars was done on CFD development kind of gives us an unfair advantage, but anyway, that's, uh, that's where it, ca it came from. So now I'm going to um, um, hand over to uh, my colleague Rob, who's, um, who's really going to uh, talk about uh, why aerodynamics are important um, and, uh, and talk about the, um, the range of CFD we're doing and uh, introduce you to high res. Okay, so um, I'll just move on from that slide. So. Um, the, the experiences we've got in our correlated CFD methods through all the range of different applications we're currently working on are going from low Reynolds number UAVs where we're doing CFD development and doing hang on, um, uh, CFD development, wind tunnel testing and getting correlation, motorsport, commercial vehicles. There's a big range of um, Reynolds number there where we're developing and have developed CFD methods that, that apply across a whole range. Um, and that spans most of the band between model scale wind tunnel testing and um, full scale real life buildings. Um, in other industries that um, where aerodynamics is important as well as motorsport and um, UAV development, um, aerospace as an example um, Boeing, since 2000, well, since the 80s, they've been doing a lot of CFD coupled with the wind tunnel testing. Um, I read yesterday that j just in 2003, so that's 15 years ago, Boeing were doing over 20,000 CFD runs a year. That's gone up and up and up. Um, Boeing still do wind tunnel testing and they do CFD. And the, the aim is to compress the product development life cycle um, to get more advanced aircraft, better efficiency, better safety. Um, so it's not, it's not just motorsport that's doing wind tunnel testing and CFD together. In every industry that WR is involved in, the use of correlated CFD and physical experimental testing for aerodynamics massively increases the aerodynamic development and product innovation rate. So a correlated CFD method for building wind loads would seem to be a good thing. So what do we mean when we say high-res CFD? Because there's a lot of people that say they do high-res CFD, but 
when we talk about it, we're talking about a very, very dense mesh. The uh, image on the left is just showing a, a slice through the mesh from a typical racing car that we've worked on. Um, the, the black area is black because the mesh is so fine you can't see the individual cells. Um, the two images to the bottom left um, show the difference between what we would consider kind of a 2005 era mesh on the bottom left, which is still, I think that model was still 250 million cells. The high resolution one on the right was a, the same, exactly the same geometry, but we had a 500 million cell mesh much more in line with what we con would consider high res. And you can see there's a lot of the flovis, a lot of the vortex structures there that are, that are captured and maintained um, and affect the rear of the car. Um, that's meant to be playing a movie, but. Um, as well as high resolution mesh, we're talking about high resolution numerics. So um, we add as many physics as we can to the to the modeling so it's the best quality turbulence modeling you can you can go for it's it's adding in thermal effects it's adding in the boundary layer modeling um, transient effects and so on um, to be able to do that you need a very big computer um, we're fortunate enough to have such a very big computer with over over 40 teraflops of hpc so that's um, around 4,000 cores dedicated to our CFD process development. Um, in order to make the best use of our CFD engineers um, and, and that hardware, we've developed lots of automated systems for how we do the meshing and how we do the queuing systems. So our, our aerodynamicists can just focus on the aerodynamics um, and let the, let the CFD take care of itself. And underpinning that, we use ANSYS Fluent because it's the best CFD software out there. It, they develop the numerics in there faster than any other package, which means that we can do turbulence modeling that no one else can. Some examples of where we've used that in architecture over the years. Um, we've done a lot of pedestrian comfort studies. Um, uh, 22 Bishop's Gates up there on the top right in London. Um, we've done some stuff just looking at buildings around Chicago over on the left there, um, and a number of other ones around London or Dubai. Q8, sorry. Um, range of high res CFD um, that we do in architecture, we've got Pedestrian comfort, as I said, but refrigeration and HVAC, um, natural ventilation. So um, there's a very there's 500 mil, no, it's a billion cell model there, bottom right, looking at the um, flow around the Valley of Cupertino, leading to um, a naturally ventilated building, um, the Apple Campus, um, and, the, and the model inside there. Um, we can do airborne pollutants, so there's a lot of clean, clean air um, things in London at the moment. Um, but wind loading is where we really want to talk about. In 2015, we went to, we came over to Chicago and um, saw Bill Baker at SOM um, and started telling him about what we could do. And he said, well, that's very interesting, but um, I'm interested in wind loading. Um, and so far, I've seen lots of people that say they can do clever CFD, but I've never been convinced. So he set us a challenge with three simple shapes as a square um, prism, one of rounded corners, and one with concave sides, um, straight on flow, and then turn it round 45 degrees. Um, and we went, fine, we'll go away, solve that, and come back and show you the results. We went away and did that and found that it was actually a much tougher challenge than we'd thought. Um, and getting, getting that oscillating force on the building right took us about two years of pretty hard development to get it to the point where we were satisfied with the correlation. And we went back and told Bill, and he was suitably impressed, and he said, OK, I've got another challenge. Um, this time, he said, so you can, you, you can get the, the mean force um, on the building, um, but what we really need to know is whether you can get the, the resonant force on it and whether you can capture the boundary layer, um, the atmospheric boundary layer accurately. 
So he set us what we've been calling the, the John Holmes Challenge. Um, it was a paper where John Holmes took a, um, a series of um, data from different wind tunnels, all with the same reference building, um, apply an atmospheric boundary layer to it, and then look at the, the mean and the resonant peak loads on it. With the method we'd developed previously from the fundamental shape study, we found that the mean, mo the mean moment correlation we got pretty much straight away. We were very happy with ourselves. Um, we then started looking at the, the resonant, adding the resonant peak loads to it, and found that we weren't anywhere near. So we went back to the drawing board and started doing more research into what was going on um, and found that the way you get the turbulence right in the atmospheric boundary layer has a massive effect on how the um, building responds um, in resonant, the, um, the resonant um, load on the building. So we did another year of development until we were satisfied that it correlated well enough. Um, and, and this is the result. So the, the gray band is the, the band of the different wind tunnel results. So there were seven or eight different wind tunnels, and, and they all came in within, within that gray band. And the red line is, is our correlation um, from CFD. Um, there's, there's an area where it's not correlating quite so well. We've got some development to fix that at the moment. But you'll notice that anywhere where we're not within the gray band, we're actually over predicting the forces. So in terms of building loads, we, we've got a conservative tool that we think would be very suitable for development. Um, what does it look like? So here we've got some off-body flow vis um, showing you the um, turbulence wakes and structures around the building. Um, so it gives you better understanding of what's going on around your building. Um, the really useful, the killer, killer application is the uh, the pressure map over the whole building. We're, get, we're getting a full pressure map over the whole building, every square inch of it, every 10,000th of a second. And you can pull that straight into your FE package. And rather than just measuring the base frequency at the bottom, you've got that, um, that load distribution all the way up the building. And you can use that for the, the structure of the building or, or your facade pressures. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, just to conclude, um, so we think we've got something which is really interesting, uh, appears to validate pretty well um, to what is, uh, what is a known uh, industry standard. Uh, we've got a lot of interest from architectural practices in the UK to do blind studies on this and take it the next stage. But I think it's a, a hugely important thing, and certainly for an engineer, seeing that cladding pressure and imagining how you could use that with 10, 10 kilohertz data in terms of the next step in terms of noise, fatigue, taking more weight out of the structure. And the other thing is understanding, instead of just having the loads at the bottom of the building, um, force and moment, yes, you can get pressure tap data, um, but understanding how those loads vary and how that might excite the structure. I think it, it's the dawn of, of something really interesting. And you look at uh, the experience of the aerospace industry, um, you know, wind tunnel testing is really, really important. It's, it's what the industry is anchored in. Um, and, uh, and, and certainly Boeing and, and other Formula One teams and other industries that use a mix of the technologies sort of start quite conservatively um, with lots of CFD validation in tunnels, but certainly the direction um, appears to be in that way. So the final thing I want to leave with you is just talking about what, what could this system have an effect on? Well, you know, if you said a, a high rise, a, a, a ton of steel takes about 10,000 kilowatt hours to produce. That's about 10,000 pounds of CO2 emitted to produce it using 2018 US uh, mix of methods. And it's about $4,000. So if you said you're using 50,000 tons of structural steel in a skyscraper, that's 500 megawatt hours, quarter of a million tons of CO2, and $200 million of steel. So if you can improve by aerodynamics the building such that you could save 1% of the structural mass, that's 500 tons of steel, 5 megawatt hours of energy, 
2,300 tons of CO2 less emissions and $2 million cost saving. The bottom line is, is every single bit of effort you can put into aerodynamic design of the buildings through CFD, wind tunnel testing or whatever, it is going to require less structure. Just like our supermarket customers want less energy from their fridges, it is socially responsible to do that. And if, if we're moving as a species towards big urban habitats, and I've got the world's eminent tall building experts in this building, I would ask a simple question. If you're socially responsible about what you're doing and you have an opportunity to save that amount of energy and resources, that's what we should be doing. Thank you so much for your attention. Have a great conference. Thank you.